Funny Stories, read by Craig Charles. Henry Pond, the Poet, by Dick King Smith. Henry Pond was a poet. All the other toads in the neighbourhood were very proud of this fact. When they spoke of him, they never referred to him as just Henry Pond, much less plain Henry, but always as Henry Pond the poet. Toads take their family names from their places of birth, the waters in which they hatch from spawn to tadpole. River is a common surname, as are lake and pool, though a few families affect double-barrelled names, such as Millpool, or duck pond. Pond is, in fact, probably the commonest of all, but Henry's gift, everyone agreed, was most uncommon. Brilliant, everyone croaked whenever his name was mentioned, and they never missed an opportunity to mention it, loudly, in front of such lesser creatures as frogs and newts. Two toads might be sitting side by side, saying nothing, simply staring vacantly out of their bulgy golden eyes, when a frog would chance to hop past. Immediately, they would start a loud conversation between themselves. Forgot to tell you, met Henry Pond the poet yesterday. Not Henry Pond the poet? Yes, what a talented toad, eh? Indeed he is, sure to win first prize at the Ice Toadford. Makes you proud to be one of us, what? And then the frog would say, in a tone of amazement, A poet? A toad that makes up poems? And the toads would reply, Hop it, frog face. We weren't croaking to you. And then they would sit in happy silence again, waiting for another passerby and another chance to sing the praises of Henry Pond the poet. Even as a tiny tadpole, Henry's talent had been obvious. His very first poem showed this. Oh, how I long and long for legs, first two and later more. For it is sure as eggs is eggs I'll finish up with four, and I shall give three rousing cheers to see my tail grow shorter till totally it disappears and I can leave the water. Henry would recite this poem to all his thousands of fellow tadpoles, or toadpoles, as he called them in his poetical way, as they swam about the pond together. But ducks, newts, fish and water beetles reduced their numbers severely, and day by day, fewer and fewer tadpoles of the pond family were left to listen to the poem. At the two-legged stage, hundreds heard it. At the four-legged stage, dozens only. And by the time their tails had disappeared and they were ready to emerge from the water as toadlets, only a handful remained to hear the latest work of Henry Pond, the poet. Remember now, our friends of yore, that vanished down the fish's moor, or in the water beetle's jaw, or duck's web paw, or newt's sharp claw, though they have passed through death's dark door, they are not lost but gone before. The survivors thought this a very beautiful poem, and a sly tear dropped from many a golden eye. Before long, however, many a golden eye closed, never to reopen, because its owner had not listened carefully enough to the next composition of Henry Pond, the poet. Now never speak to strangers, a crow, a snake, a rat, for life is full of dangers, and cows will squash you flat, and flatly you'll be sorry if you should cross the road. It doesn't take a lorry to pulverise a toad. Not all of Henry's poems were gloomy. Now, as he grew to Toad's estate 
and put away tad Polish things, he began to experience the pleasures of grown-up life, and a good deal of his poetry was full of joy. It was about this stage that he began to be spoken of for the first time, among the rivers, the lakes, the pools and other toad families as Henry Pond the poet. By now he was living in an old stone shed, a splendidly dark, damp, snail-filled pad he shared with several other young bachelor toads, and it was here that he began his poetry recitals. Regularly, each month, at the time of the full moon, a large company of local toads would assemble to hear the poet croak his latest piece and to enjoy many of the old favourites. Poems about food were always popular, and to appreciate this one, you must realise that every toad can draw its eyes down into its head and thus squash its prey between the bottom of the eyeballs and the tongue. Oh, worms are nice and slugs are nice, and the centipedes and the old wood lice, but search as you may, o'er hill and dale, there's nothing as nice as a big fat snail and each verse was followed by a rousing chorus. fee fi fo fung squeeze your eyeballs on your tongue. Fung-fo-fi-fee, squash a slimy snail for tea. Beetles are nice, and bugs are nice, and the litter of wriggling baby mice, but say it as you may, or dale and hill, a big fat snail's the nicest still. To begin with, Henry would recite this poem alone, but the other toads soon learned the words of the chorus, and each time the poet finished the verse, the whole audience would croak together. Fee, fi, fo, fung, squeeze your eyeballs on your tongue. Fung, fo, fi, fee, squash a slimy snail for tea. It was, in fact, at one of these full moon recitals, just as the sound of that chorus died away, that Henry Pond the poet fell in love. She was squatting in the front row, her wide mouth slightly open, her golden eyes fixed upon him. She was hypnotised, it seemed, by his poetry. Henry delivered himself of a final set of verses, and then, as the audience began to crawl away, hastily consulted one of his friends. Who is that amazingly lovely girl in the front row? he whispered. Oh, that's Victoria Gardenpool, said his friend. Tadpole of her year she was, and considered to be a great beauty now that she's come out. With fast beating heart, Henry approached the great beauty. She was thickly covered, he could see, with the most delightful warts. Her eyes were half closed now and her mouth hung wider still. Henry, supposing her to be overcome with ecstasy at his recital, was about to speak, when suddenly she yawned, opened her eyes and said, Is it finished? Yes, said Henry. Did you enjoy it? Enjoy it, croaked Victoria Gardenpool. I have seldom spent such a boring evening. Who on earth was that person spouting all that rubbish? Henry opened his mouth to say me, and then realising that she did not recognise him, replied, That was Henry Pond the poet. He seems very fond of the sound of his own voice, said Victoria Gardenpool. Poets are all the same, I suppose. Wet and windy like the weather. Myself, I prefer toads of action. And she turned her warty back on Henry and waddled out. Wait! called Henry, crawling hastily after her. But when he got outside, he could see that there was a toad waiting for Victoria, a barely muscular fellow who looked very much a toad of action. Henry consulted his friend again. Who's that? he said. That, said his friend, is Larry Lake. They say that when he was a tadpole, he fought off a minnow and he's been known to eat a full-grown mouse, tail and all. He's crawling out with Victoria. I shouldn't tangle with him if I were you. Oh, said Henry Pond, the poet. 
oh dear. And he watched sadly as the couple disappeared into the night. In the weeks that followed, as the moon waned and waxed again, Henry could think of only one thing. Would Victoria come to his next poetry reading? It didn't seem likely, but maybe Larry Lake would bring her, if he was fond of poetry. But that didn't seem likely either. Just in case, however, Henry worked hard at composing a new poem. It was a love poem, in which he would pour out his heart as he squatted before her, gazing into her eyes, croaking to her and her alone. He finished it just before the moon was full again. Come swim with me and be my love. The fish below, the birds above, come swim with me from shore to shore and be my love for evermore. Come hop with me across the vale, We'll feast on worm and slug and snail. Come, fairest toad, that e'er I saw, And be my love for evermore. Come crawl with me along the strand, Sit by the water hand in hand, And dream of joys that lie in store, And be my love for evermore. But alas, when his audience gathered once again to hear the latest works of Henry Pond, the poet, Victoria Gardenpool was not amongst them. Henry did not feel he could recite his new love poem. It was for her and for her only. But in case she did not come, he had prepared another new poem of quite a different type. Since Victoria had declared her liking for toads of action, Henry had been trying hard to convince himself that he was one. He practised blowing himself up to look large and terrifying and making clumsy hops at imaginary enemies. You may fancy yourself as a real he-toad, Larry Lake, he said to himself, but Henry Pond is not just a poet, you know. He too is a toad of action, and his new poem was designed to tell this to his listeners. Who is bold and strong and rough? Shout it out, you know it. Who is brave and fierce and tough? And then he thought they will all say, Henry Pond the poet. But that evening, once he had seen the Victoria Garden Pool was not present, and therefore tried out the second of his two new poems, things did not turn out as he had hoped. Who is bold and strong and rough? he said. Shout it out, you know it! Who is brave and fierce and tough? And a voice at the back croaked, Larry Lake. No, no, said Henry rather testily. You should have said Henry Pond the poet. Poet rhymes with know it. Larry Lake doesn't rhyme with anything. Who was the stupid person who said that? At this, there was a disturbance in the audience. A barely muscular toad was bullocking his way through them, shouldering them out of his path, until at last he squatted face to face with Henry. I was that stupid person, said Larry Lake. Oh, said Henry Pond the poet, oh dear. And since you're so rough and tough, said Larry, come on outside. Toads are cold-blooded creatures anyway, but Henry's blood ran even colder now. What for? he said. That's what I'm going to give you, said Larry Lake. I'm going to give you what for. I saw you making eyes at my lady friend. Don't think I didn't. Now I'm going to give you a good hiding. For a moment, the audience was silent, stunned by this sudden drama in the midst of a recital. Then they began to realise that watching a wrestling match might be a nice change from listening to poetry and they started to move out in a body carrying Henry and Larry along with them. Once outside, they formed a ring round the two toads. There were a few, some of the Lake family, and some who wanted to toady to Larry, 
who began to root for him with croaks of, Get him, Larry boy! Squeeze his eyeballs on his trunk! But there were many, for Larry's bully boy ways had not made him popular, who were cheering for Henry. Who is bold and strong and rough? Hear us shout, we know it! Who is brave and fierce and tough? Henry Bond the poet! Then silence fell, as an old and respected toad entered the ring to act as referee. You know the rules, he said to the contestants. Three falls or two submissions, and may the best toad win. Henry sat motionless, wishing very much that he had not made up such a silly poem. He had never enjoyed rough games and had no idea what to do. But Larry had. Crawling forward, he got behind Henry, wrapped his forearms around the poet's neck, and with one almighty heave, pulled him over onto his back. Henry lay kicking helplessly while above the noise of the crowd, the referee called, Fool number one! Larry Lake sat waiting for Henry to right himself. I wish the garden pool girl was here, he thought, to see me make a mess of this wimp. And at that moment, he caught sight of her crawling up to the ringside, attracted by all the noise. Hi, Victoria, he croaked. Watch this. A big lake beats a little pond any day. The sound of his beloved's name made Henry turn his head to look at her, and as he did so, Larry Lake took a large hop forward and butted him under the chin. Once again, Henry fell flat on his back. Fall number two, called the referee. The Lake supporters were jubilant. One more fall and the match was Larry's. Easy! Easy, they began to chant, while Henry's fans were gloomily silent as their toad struggled to his feet once more. They waited for what seemed the certain end to the fight. Larry Lake waited, his face split in a sneering grin. Victoria Gardenpool waited, her golden eyes fixed upon the toad of action. Come on, Larry, she called. She did not spare a glance for the poet. Henry waited too, for his head to clear, and when at last it did, he found, rather to his surprise, that he was very angry. Who is brave and fierce and tough? he asked himself. Why, I am. And crawling swiftly towards Larry Lake, he suddenly shot out his large, flat, pink, sticky tongue and hit his opponent in the eye. As Larry reeled, half-blinded, Henry hit him in the other one. Then nimbly, he grabbed one of Larry's long hind legs and began to bend it the wrong way, harder and harder, until at last the toad of action beat helplessly on the ground with a forepaw in token of defeat. Submission number one! Henry waited sportingly until Larry had cleaned his eyes. But though he was still, his mind was racing. I mustn't let him close with me, he thought. He's much stronger and heavier, but he's slow. I must keep out of his way, wear him down, tire him out. And that is exactly what happened. Henry sidestepped every leap and lunge that Larry made, ducked under every hop, slipped out of every attempted grasp, until at last the big toad sat exhausted, puffing and blowing in the middle of the ring. Then Henry heard a single voice above the noise of the crowd, a voice that was heavenly music in his ears. Come on, Henry! called Victoria Gardenpool, and at that he leaped upon his enemy's broad back and got him in a full Nelson and pressed down with super toadish strength until at last, in a strangled, broken croak, Larry Lake cried, I submit! I submit! And the referee, hopping forward, raised high in victory the paw of Henry Pond, the poet. Much later that night, Henry and Victoria sat by the water, hand in hand, and the words of the poet floated out over the moonlit ripples. 
Come swim with me and be my love. The fish below, the birds above, come swim with me from shore to shore and be my love forevermore. Come hop with me across the vale, we'll feast on worm and slug and snail. Come, fair as toad, that air I saw, and be my love forevermore. Come crawl with me along the strand, sit by the water hand in hand, and dream of joys that lie in store, and be my love forevermore. It's funny, said Victoria, when I first heard your poetry, I didn't think much of it, but I do like that one. Am I really the fairest toad you ever saw, Henry? You are, said Henry. In that case, said Victoria, I think I should rather like to be your love forevermore. And then she heard the shortest of all Henry's many compositions. Oh, Victoria, I adore you, said Henry Pond, the poet. How Clara Bebs Put Strettle Street Properly on the Map by Robin Klein Strettle Street looked like a long, boring sentence with no punctuation marks. No one ever moved away and nobody knew ever came there to live. Nothing exciting or different ever happened there. And the postman always knew exactly how long it would take him to get up one side of Strettle Street and down the other side. The footpaths were made of tired grey concrete, which looked dismal even when the sun was shining. So Clara Bebs, who lived at number 47, decided to put Strettle Street properly on the map. She bought a box of silver foil stars and glued them all over the footpath. It took ages, but she had plenty of spare time because it was school holidays. People walked along Strettle Street and examined the stars glittering beneath their feet. It's nice once you get used to it, they said. There was a very steep hill in Strettle Street. Clara Bebs noticed that people had difficulty with their heavy shopping trolleys. So she went home and designed an apparatus. She was extremely good at engineering, although she was only ten. The apparatus she designed was a wire running along the fences, with hooks and a pulley. She showed Mrs Agnew how it worked. You just attach your shopping trolley to a hook and pull this lever, she explained. Mrs Agnew did that and watched her shopping trolley trundle gently up the steep hill to her front gate. I'll tell the other ladies, she said. Fancy finding something like that in Strettle Street. Oh, it's nothing really, Clara Bebb said modestly. I can think up lots more complicated things. There was a brick house that had always been empty. It was quite new, but nobody ever bought it because Strettle Street looked such a dull place to live. Clara Bebs asked the estate agent if she could borrow the house for the school holidays. She made it into a swimming pool by removing the roof and filling all the rooms with water. It's free, she told everyone in Strettle Street. They liked it very much because they could wave to their neighbours while they swam about behind the picture windows and the chimney made a very good diving tower. Even the postman had time to stop for a swim, because he just had to hitch his post bag onto Clara Bebs' automatic shopping trolley apparatus, and it trundled gently up and down Strettle Street, all by itself. Clara bought some tins of special paint that glowed in the dark, and painted all the doors in Strettle Street in beautiful colours. That's pretty, said the people who lived there. And instead of staying inside watching television in the evenings, they all came outside to look at everyone's front doors instead. Clara Bebs built a stage in the middle of the street where it wouldn't interfere with the traffic, and she started evening competition programmes. 
Every evening she thought up a new, interesting competition, such as who could suck a lemon the longest without pulling a horrible face, and who could touch their ear with their elbow, and who could learn to play the mandolin in ten minutes. The competitions became very popular, and people brought along folding chairs, and their knitting, and their babies in carry baskets. In the daylight hours, Clara used the stage for a bring-something-take-something something market. People would arrive with goldfish bowls and three balls of purple mohair wool, and net bags filled with oranges and stuff like that, and they put all the things in a pile on the stage. And you could choose anything from the pile to take home with you. Next, Clara organised brisk, exciting chariot races for Saturday afternoons. With real chariots she built herself in her parents' tool shed. If you didn't like chariots, she had free elephant rides. Or you could just sit and watch the races from the steel observation tower she built at the end of Strettle Street. On weekdays, she used the tower to instruct people who wished to learn skydiving. Strettle Street was looking less and less boring. Clara rented some earth-moving equipment and set to work on the vacant block of land next to her house, and made a marvellous jungle with monkeys and a swamp and tropical butterflies. When she finished that, she designed and constructed a huge slippery slide, which swept from one end of the street to the other, suspended above the rooftops, and she also made an underground tunnel beneath Strettle Street, ending in an underground lake lit by concealed lighting. You could cross the lake using ten-metre-high mechanical stilts with inbuilt safety nets, which anyone could use after three minutes' easy practice. Soon, Strettle Street didn't look boring at all, and lots of people who didn't even live there would come along to visit and see what new things Clara Bebs had designed that week. They told their friends who came also, and Strettle Street became rather too noisy and crowded, in spite of the ten-storey cantilevered car park Clara had built above her parents' tool shed. It's not really fair, Mrs Agnew told Clara Bebs. We can hardly move with all these new people standing around gaping. Why don't they all go back to their own streets and leave us in peace? Maybe because their streets are just as boring as Strettle Street used to be, before I decided to put it properly on the map, said Clara Bebs. But I'll think of a solution. So she added an eleventh story to the car park and installed a large electronic sign which said, College for Street Decorators. And in no time at all, she had over a hundred students enrolled for the first lecture. Soon Strettle Street wasn't the only interesting street in town, and crowds ceased to be a problem. All the visiting people were back in their own streets, fixing them up nicely, as Clara Bebs had shown them in the College for Street Decorators. When the holidays ended and she had to go back to school herself, everyone who lived in Strettle Street thanked her for her time and trouble. There's nothing we need now, they said happily. We've got everything possible in Strettle Street. I forgot one thing, though, said Clara Bebs. A cat for every front doormat. That's what I forgot. So she called in at the Lost Cats home and collected 47 cats and placed one on each front doormat as she walked up Strettle Street on her way to school. There, she said, now it's finished. McCaw and the Blackberry Fish Cakes by John S. Cotton. When Patsy's mum and dad took over Crab Cove's fish and chip shop, they took over McCaw as well. Patsy, who had always wanted a pet bird, 
thought Macaw was beautiful, with his red, yellow and blue wings and his red breast. Unfortunately, her mother did not think Macaw was quite so lovely. I'd have thought twice about coming if I'd known that bird was here, Mrs Forum said. I'm sure it will cost us a fortune to keep. Macaw had been left behind by the old owner of the shop because he was going into a rest home and couldn't take his bird with him. Rest homes had strict rules about such things. Isn't there a tropical bird garden we can give him to? Mrs Forum wondered. Squaw! screamed Macaw. I don't think he likes that idea, Mr Forum told his wife. Nor do I, said Patsy, pulling a face. So Macaw stayed, which pleased Patsy very much, and things went quite smoothly until the day of the Crab Cove Hospital fate. The fate began in the morning and went on all day. Patsy's mum was helping out on Mrs Hatwistle's stall. Patsy and Macaw had gone along as well. Macaw was perched on his favourite spot on Patsy's mop of red hair. <coughs> he shrieked at passers-by, but in a friendly way. Mrs Hatwistle's stall was full of goodies. Homemade wine, homemade jam, cakes, biscuits. Everything looks lovely, Mrs Hatwistle said Patsy. Hat whistle! screamed McCaw. Really, Patsy, said Mrs Forum, looking embarrassed. You must teach that bird some manners. Sorry, Mrs Hat whistle, said Patsy. Bless me, dear, I don't mind, laughed Mrs Hat whistle. I think McCaw is a scream. Scream! screamed McCaw. Uh, well, we'll have a look round and come back later, said Patsy. Now, at this time, out in the middle of Crab Bay, there was a large white luxury yacht. It belonged to Mr Hiram J. Beefy, the American beef burger millionaire. He owned burger bars all over America and was shaped a bit like a beef burger himself. Mr Beefy and his wife, Lydia, were on a world cruise. What a darling little place! Mrs. Beefy said when she saw Crab Cove. She was as thin as a stick insect, which made people laugh when they heard her married name. Hiram J. sighed. Yes, honey. He was bored with cruising. Getting ideas to improve his burger bars was what interested him, and he didn't think Crab Cove would provide him with any of those. But he was wrong. Back at the fate, McCaw had taken off from Patsy's hair, which he had got into the habit of using as a landing pad, and flown over to Mrs Hatwistle's stall again. He seemed especially interested in a bottle of wine that hung in a basket under the canopy of the stall. Blackberry wine, only one pound fifty, it said on the label. Scar, said McCaw and he picked up the basket by the handle and flew off with it over the heads of the crowd. McCaw, cried Mrs Forum, bring that back at once. McCaw didn't even look round. A few minutes later, when Patsy arrived back carrying a large chocolate ice cream, she could see something was wrong by the look on her mother's face. Where's McCaw? she said. That bird! shouted Mrs Forum. In fact, McCaw had taken his prize home. He flew into the kitchen at the back of Forum's fish parlour and perched on a shelf above the worktop. Then slowly he pecked the cork from the bottle of wine, the neck hanging over the edge of the shelf, and the wine poured steadily downwards, straight into a large bowl which stood on the worktop. In the bowl was a fishy mixture. McCaw lost interest in the bottle after the wine had stopped gurgling, and he flew out of the window in search of some new adventure. The fishy mixture gradually changed colour. Several minutes later, Mr Forum returned to his kitchen after answering the phone. Now, what was I doing? he said to himself. Ah, yes, the fish cake mix. 
Andy went over to the large bowl on the worktop and began stirring it. He didn't notice that the fish cake mix had more of a pinky tinge to it now. Out on Hiram J. Beefy's yacht, the millionaire and his wife were having a late breakfast. Mrs. Beefy was eating a grapefruit while her husband tucked into a king-sized beef burger of the sort that had made him his fortune. Suddenly, there was a flapping sound, and they both turned to see McCaw landing on the rail of the yacht. Look, honey, said Hiram J. It's a McCaw. Lydia looked tickled pink. I wonder if it talks, she said. She didn't have to wonder long. Pie and chips, chicken and chips, beef fritters, fish cakes, pasta vinegar, screamed McCaw. Hiram Jay stared in astonishment. Did you hear that, Lydia? He's telling you what is on the menu at some restaurant. Now that's where I call smart, a flying advertisement. Where's the salt? shrieked McCaw and flew off towards Crab Cove. Hiram J. Beefy forgot about his breakfast. I have to find out where he's going. I've never tasted a pea fritter. Who knows? Maybe it's something I can introduce into the burger bars. And he called for one of his crew to launch the small boat. Patsy had arrived back at the shop in time for the midday opening. Because Mrs. Forum was staying at the fate, Patsy was to act as waitress at the four tables in the Forum's fish parlour. But she was worried about McCaw. Patsy told her father what the bird had done at the fate. Dear me, was all that Mr. Forum said. At that moment, McCaw flew past the window and perched on the hanging sign outside the shop. There he is, cried Patsy. He's not carrying any bottles of wine, Mr. Forum observed. Oh dear, said Patsy. I wonder what he's done with it. Just then, a large man in expensive yachting clothes came into the shop and collapsed into a chair at one of the tables. He had obviously been running. Is that your bird? He gasped, nodding to the macaw outside. Uh, yes, Patsy admitted, wondering what macaw had been up to now. But the man just gave a nod and said, Good. Without looking at the menu, he said, I'll have two pea fritters, two fish cakes, and some chips, please. Yes, sir, said Patsy, one eye on McCaw. Yes, sir, said McCaw, through the open window. The American stayed right through lunchtime. He ate what he had ordered, then he asked Patsy to bring him some more of those delicious fish cakes. He's got an enormous appetite, Patsy whispered to her father. It's very strange, said Mr. Forum, but several customers have come back for more fish cakes today. They're all saying how nice they are. It's a good job I made an extra large helping of mixture. It was much later, when Patsy was busy clearing up in the kitchen, that she glanced up and saw the empty wine bottle on the shelf. So that's where it got to, she said. Then she noticed the empty bowl on the worktop beneath it. Oh, my goodness! Dad! she called. Mr. Forum came into the kitchen. Uh, your fish cakes, she said. Did you mix them in that? Patsy nodded to the bowl beneath the empty wine bottle. Yes, said Mr. Forum. Why? Patsy pointed to the empty wine bottle. I, er... Uh, think you had something extra in today's mix. Mr. Forum looked up at the bottle. Whatever? Mrs. Hatwistle's blackberry wine, said Patsy. Oh, said Mr. Forum. Later, when the shop was closing for the afternoon, Hiram J. Beefy went over to the counter to speak to Mr. Forum and Patsy. Sir, he said, I'd like to congratulate you on a most original dish. You would, said Mr. Forum, looking surprised. The American nodded. I'm talking about your fish cakes. I've never tasted any like them before. You must have your own special recipe. 
Well, began Mr. Forum, Hiram J. held up a hand. No, I don't expect you to tell me your recipe for nothing. What do you say to a thousand dollars? Mr. Forum blinked in astonishment. Patsy's mouth fell open. Oh, well, really, I, I couldn't, Mr. Forum began. Nonsense, said Hiram J. I insist on paying you something. I want to make and sell them in my burger bars in America. But it was an accident, said Mr. Forum. Now it was Hiram J. Beefy's turn to look surprised. Accident? Mr. Forum explained about McCaw and the bottle of wine. And so what you had this morning, he finished, were blackberry fish cakes. A sort of freak fish cake. Hiram J. began to laugh. Let's get this straight, he chuckled. It's a normal fish cake mix, plus one bottle of blackberry wine. And he laughed and laughed. Patsy and Mr. Forum laughed with him. In the end, because Mr. Forum wouldn't take any money, the millionaire made a generous donation to the hospital fate fund. And Mr. Forum told him how to make pea fritters free of charge. So Hiram J. Beefy went away. A very happy man. Wait until we tell Mum, said Patsy, after the American had gone. She'll have to let McCaw stay now. Blackberry fish cakes could make us millionaires like Mr. Beefy. Well, we've already sold more than three times the number we usually do, he agreed. We must tell Mrs. Atwistle. After all, it was her blackberry wine that did the trick. We'll have to go into business together. The Hat Whistling Forum Blackberry Fish Cake Company. Mr. Forum laughed. Blackberry Fish Cake? screamed McCaw, automatically adding an extra item to his squawk aloud menu. Blackberry Fish Cakes? And after that day, they became a regular feature at Forum's Fish Parlour. Elephant Milk Hippopotamus Cheese by Margaret Mahi. There was once an orphan called Dee Dee who had the biggest feet in the world. They were so big she had grown extra strong ankles and knees in order to pick them up and put them down again. These enormous feet were a great embarrassment to her and to the matron of the orphanage as well. She didn't like having such a big-footed orphan clumping around her. She thought it spoiled the look of the orphanage. Now, just down the road, there lived a man and a woman who were so lazy they had not washed the dishes for three years. Dirty dishes were piled up to the kitchen ceiling, down the hall and along the garden path. It was lucky for them they had been given so many cups, saucers and plates when they were married. However, they got up and looked around and found they had run out of clean dishes. What shall we do, cried the man. We positively can't wash all these, and yet there isn't a clean dish in the house. Ring up the orphanage, suggested his wife, and we'll adopt a daughter to wash our dishes for us. Then... When she's done, we'll eat clean again. What a good idea, cried the man, and he rang up the orphanage at once. Have you got a girl orphan who can cook and clean all day and half the night as well, he asked. I don't want one that needs a lot of food or sleep, but I want one that's a good, strong, steady girl because there's a lot to do around here and my wife and I are very delicate. Oh, yes, yes, said the orphanage matron. We have just the orphan for you. Her name is Weedy Dee Dee. She won't eat much. She's little and thin, but she's got such big feet she's as steady as a rock. I'll send her round in a brace of shakes. 
Then she went to the window and called, Dee Dee, Dee Dee, Wee Dee Dee Dee, pack your bag and sign the book. You've been adopted by the people down the road. Wee Dee 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 came clumping down the road from the orphanage, her big feet looking particularly enormous in their blue sneakers. She was about as tall as a rose bush, thin as string, with hair like bootlaces and feet like rowboats. But she had gentle, hopeful eyes and a lovely smile. When she saw the dishes all the way down the garden path, she sighed and set to work. She washed cups and saucers, bread and butter plates, dinner plates, soup bowls, pudding bowls, mugs, glasses and tankards. She rinsed knives and forks and spoons and then scoured saucepans, soup pots and frying pans. She washed dishes all the way up the garden path, all the way down the hall and all the way through the kitchen from floor to ceiling. Finally, every dish was clean and every spoon sparkling. What next? asked Weedy Dee Dee, for she knew there was more to come. Dear adopted daughter Dee Dee, said the man, you may do the washing. And then the ironing, said his wife. Make the beds, commanded the man. Polish the furniture, cried the woman. Chase the spiders, swat the flies, sweep, dust. And then when you've done that, you may weed the garden, the man concluded. It looks like a full morning, thought Weedy Dee Dee. So she set to work. Though she was little and stringy, she was strong at heart. She washed and ironed, made and polished, chased and swatted, and swept, dusted and weeded. The house shone like a treasure, as much to be looked at as lived in. That's that, said Weedy Dee Dee. And now, dear adopted parents, may I please have something to eat, because I'm very hungry, and it's a long way past my dinner time. The man and the woman looked at each other in dismay. They hadn't reckoned on feeding her. She's very small, said the man doubtfully. Except for her feet the woman muttered. I've heard that those with extra large feet eat extra large dinners in order to maintain them. And she's worked very hard too. She must be tremendously hungry by now, the man said. Never mind. I have an idea. Leave this to me. Then he turned to Dee Dee. Dear adopted daughter, he said, we have a delicious meal of roast turkey and cranberry sauce, not to mention three colours of jelly and ice cream for pudding. But your dear adopted mother and I have one more job for you. We want you to paint the ceiling. It certainly needs it, said Dee Dee. Where's the ladder? That's the problem. We don't have a ladder, said the man with a horrid smile. Then I'll stand on the table, Dee Dee said. What? cried the woman. Stand on my beautiful, polished mahogany table with your whopping great feet? Never! But I can't reach the ceiling, exclaimed Dee Dee. I'm too small. Oh dear, the man said, shaking his head. So you are. How tragic. You'd better go back to the orphanage until you've grown taller. How sad it breaks our hearts. And you've done so well, too, up until now. That's it, said the woman. Come back when you're taller. You're still our dear adopted daughter, and we'll think of you fondly and pray for the day that you grow about three feet further towards the ceiling. Weedy Dee Dee hadn't unpacked yet. She clumped all the way back to the orphanage with a change of clothes and a toothbrush and a small case. But when she got there, the gate was closed tight. Off you go, said the matron, popping her head out of the window. We got another orphan in the moment you left, and there isn't any room now for you. What shall I do? asked Weedy Dee Dee. Anything you like, said the matron. 
You're as free as a bird. Ah, freedom, freedom. Would that I were as free and as happy-go-lucky as you. And she popped her head back in again and locked the window just to make sure. So Weedy Deedy was turned loose on the world to wander and wonder. The roads of the world were very dusty and long, but luckily, at that time of the year, they were very pretty, all tangled along the sides with buttercups, daisies and foxgloves. She wandered and she wondered for quite a long time, until even her feet became sore and tired, in spite of being big. So when she came to a clear stream, its banks all tall with foxgloves, Weedy Deedy sat down on the bank, took off her blue sneakers and put her feet into the water where they floated like two great white fish among the cresses. Oh, I'm so hungry, sighed Weedy Deedy. I could eat a whole fried elephant and still have room for, for a hippopotamus in chocolate sauce for pudding. Funnily enough, just as she said this, an elephant came round the corner of the road, and then another, and another, until there was a whole herd of elephants eating up the buttercups and daisies. Then a hippopotamus came round the corner, and another, and another, until a whole herd of hippos was waddling by, all smiling and beguiling in the afternoon sunshine. Then came a different sound of feet. Really big feet this time. Feet that were certainly even bigger than Weedy Dee Dee's. She could hear them coming down the road and around the corner, and the thought of bigger feet than hers so terrified her that she jumped up and tried to hide in a clump of foxgloves. She was so weedy. She fitted in among the foxgloves easily. All except her feet, of course. They, poor lonely things that they were, had to stay sticking out into the world where everyone could see them. Suddenly, the herdsman, owner of the herds of elephants and hippos, came round the corner. He was definitely a giant, young and probably very handsome. Except he was so big, it was difficult to take him in all at once. By the time you got to his nose, you had forgotten what his eyebrows were like. He had a lion bounding beside him, a kind of working dog. He saw Weedy Deedee's sneakers, looking like blue canoes, moored among the buttercups and daisies on the bank of the stream. What beautiful shoes! he cried wistfully. Oh, if I were to find the feet that fitted this footwear, I know I would love them. Weedy Deedy couldn't help wiggling her toes through sheer nervousness, and the movement caught the giant's blue eyes. What beautiful feet sticking out of the foxgloves, he exclaimed in amazement. What rounded rosy heels, what wonderful wiggling toes. If I could meet the maiden attached to these adorable extremities, I would make her mine. These must be the most beautiful feet in the whole world. Weedy Deedy couldn't help laughing. They're the biggest anyway, she cried, looking out through the foxgloves. The giant stared at her in astonishment. Then he began to laugh too. The lion licked Weedy Deedee's feet and made them tickle, so that the laughing went on for some time. Well, that's life, said the giant at last. I find a pair of feet to love, and they're attached to little Deedee, who's no bigger than a rose bush. Never mind. Come out of the foxgloves. For well, there's no need to hide. The lion's tame, and so am I. The elephants and the hippos can wallow and graze, and you can sit down and share my lunch with me. That would be wonderful, said Weedy Deedy, because I've had a really full day so far. I was adopted first thing this morning, 
Then I washed three years of dirty dishes and tidied a very untidy house. Then it turned out I wasn't tall enough to paint the ceiling and I had to go back to the orphanage until I grew three feet taller. But meanwhile, the orphanage had got another orphan in my place, so I was set free as a bird and I wandered and wondered my way here. I'm as hungry as a hippopotamus, for I haven't had a bite or sup all day. It doesn't bear thinking of, said the giant, and passed a slice of cheese as big as a tea tray and a cup of milk as large as a bucket, while his elephants grazed around, eating the buttercups and daisies, and the hippos had a nice wet wallow under the willow trees. A strange thing happened as Weedy Deedy ate the cheese and drank the milk. She thought that her feet had suddenly grown smaller. Look at that, she cried. My feet have suddenly gone all little. What a pity. Up till now, my feet were the only bit of me that anyone has ever admired. They haven't got smaller, said the giant. It's you who've grown taller. It must be from drinking elephant milk and eating hippopotamus cheese. After all, that's what I've eaten all my life, and look at me. You've actually grown about three feet taller. What? cried Weedy Deedy. Do you mean that I've grown tall enough to paint the ceiling? Just when I was enjoying myself. Oh, forget about that, said the giant. Stay here and grow even taller and marry me. I've got a castle up on the hill with a garden full of sunflowers. Be mine, and we will herd elephants and hippos together and garden and have forty-nine children, seven times seven, and live happily ever after. Now she was a bit bigger and could take in rather more of the giant's enormous face. Weedy Deedy could see he had a nose she liked and trusted. That sounds like a wonderful life, she said. But I'd better paint the ceiling first and tell my parents that I'm getting married. After all, they did adopt me this morning and my mother might like to help me make my wedding dress. I've read that that's what mothers do. I'll go home, paint the ceiling and get the wedding dress and then I'll come back to you. Take some milk and cheese to eat on the way, said the giant. I've plenty left. So Dee Dee put some milk and cheese into a bundle, put on her blue sneakers, and set off over the roads of the world, golden in the evening sunlight. The man and the woman who had adopted her were eating a dinner of roast turkey and cranberry sauce. Three colours of jelly, as well as ice cream, stood waiting for their attention. Dirty breakfast and lunch dishes were piled on the clean bench. Dee Dee looked at them sternly. It's our darling adopted daughter back again so soon, said the man uneasily. And she's grown, remarked the woman sourly. She has grown. She's grown enough to paint the ceiling after all. It shows what you can do if you put your mind to it. The paint pots are in the wash house, the man said. Dee Dee mixed the paint and cleaned the brushes. Without any trouble at all, she painted the ceiling, while the man and the woman watched her, throwing the turkey bones over their shoulders. Dear adopted mother, said Dee Dee while she painted, I am going to be married, and I thought you might help me make my wedding dress. Me? screeched the woman. Me? Make a wedding dress? For a weedy, not-so-little Dee Dee that I've only just met today? Think again. Dee Dee did think again, and looked very seriously at her darling adopted mother. The man smiled at her weakly. Have a wing of turkey, he said. Only a wing. There isn't a lot of meat on a turkey, and my wife and I were very delicate, you know. And the doctor said, Thank you. I brought my own supper, Dee Dee replied and she poured her elephant milk into a tall vase and put her hippopotamus cheese on a platter before her. What's that? 
asked her adopted parents greedily. Elephant milk and hippopotamus cheese, Dee Dee told them, and she drank every drop and ate every crumb. Suddenly, her feet looked a lot smaller and the ceiling a lot closer. Weedy Dee Dee was weedy no more. She grew up through the house. Her arms went out through the windows. Her head burst through the ceiling, stretching towards the sky. She felt the whole house lift off its floor and fold around her as a wedding dress of wood and tin, shining with polish and paint. Down below the floor, the man and the woman sat among their great sets of dishes, dirty and clean, staring at her with terror. Weedy Dee Dee had grown at last to match her feet. Get your great feet out of here, shouted the man, sounding as whining as a spiteful gnat. Get out, get out, you diabolical Dee Dee! I'm going. I'm taking my feet where they will be well and truly appreciated, Dee Dee replied calmly. And don't Call me Dee Dee any more. Call me Desiri. Back up the road went Dee Dee Desiri, wearing the wedding dress house, until the road to the whale led her to the giant's castle. The giant came down through the sunflowers to meet her, his faithful lion bounding at his side. I was waiting for you, he said. What took you so long? Painting the ceiling, said Dee Dee Desiri with a laugh. This is the only wedding dress in the world with a painted ceiling. So they were married, and together they washed dishes and weeded gardens, herded hippos and milked elephants. They had seven times seven, forty-nine children, who played among the sunflowers. And these children grew to be the most beautiful and happy giants in the land, with bright eyes and the nicest feet in the world. And so they should have been, for they lived on elephant milk, hippopotamus cheese, and a handful of sunflower seeds, whenever they felt like a change. The Ugsome Thing by Ruth Ainsworth There was once a monster called the Ugsome Thing. He was round and fat and scaly, and he had long teeth twisted like sticks of barley sugar. He lived in a castle and had many servants to wait on him. They had to clean his castle and cook his food and till his fields and tend his flocks and herds. Though they worked hard, he never paid them a penny in wages. The Ugsome Thing had a magic power, and if he could make anyone lose his temper, that person became his slave and had to obey him. At this time, the Ugsome Thing had all the servants he wanted except for one. He had not a good washerwoman. His clothes were often dirty and badly ironed. Now, as he went through the village near his castle, he passed a cottage garden which was full on a Monday of the whitest clothes he had ever seen. They were like snow, blowing and billowing on the line stretched between two apple trees. He decided to make the old woman who lived there come and do his washing. It would be very simple. He only had to make her lose her temper and she would be in his power. So, one Monday morning... When her clothesline was full of the whitest wash possible, he cut the line with his knife, and the snowy clothes lay tumbled on the dirty grass. Surely that would make her lose her temper. When the old woman saw what had happened, she came running out of the door, and instead of losing her temper, she said quietly, Well, 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 
the chimney has been smoking this morning, and I'm sure some smuts must have blown on my washing. Anyway, it will be a good idea to wash it again. How lucky that the line broke, just this morning and no other. So she picked up armfuls of the dirty clothes and went back to the wash house, singing as she went. The ugsome thing was very angry, and he gnashed his barley sugar teeth, but he soon thought of another idea to make her lose her temper. On Tuesday, the ugsome thing visited the old woman again. He saw that she had milked her cow, Daisy, and that the milk stood in a pan in the dairy. He turned the whole pan of milk sour. Surely that would make her lose her temper. When the old woman saw the pan of sour milk, she said, Well, well, well. Now I shall have to make it into cream cheese, and that will be a treat for my grandchildren when they come to tea. They love having cream cheese on their scones. How lucky the milk turned sour just today and no other. The ugsome thing was very angry, and he gnashed his barley sugar teeth, but he soon thought of another idea to make her lose her temper. On Wednesday, the ugsome thing visited the old woman again. He turned all the hollyhocks in her garden into thistles, the red ones and the pink ones and the double yellow ones. She was very proud of her garden. Surely that would make her lose her temper. Well, 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 said the old woman when she saw thistles growing by the wall instead of hollyhocks. I was going to pick a bunch of hollyhocks today for my friend's birthday, but now I shall make her a pincushion instead and stuff it with thistle down. So she made a velvet pincushion and stuffed it with thistle down and embroidered a flower on it. It looked nearly as pretty as the hollyhocks and lasted much longer. How lucky I am that I noticed all those thistles just today and no other, she said as she sewed up the pincushion. The ugsome thing was very angry and gnashed his barley sugar teeth, but he soon thought of another idea to make her lose her temper. On Thursday, the ugsome thing stretched a piece of string across the stairs, hoping that the old woman would trip over it and fall. Surely that would make her lose her temper. The old woman did fall and hurt her knee and had to hop on one leg to the shed to milk Daisy the cow. Well, 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 said the old woman. I can't do any housework today. I shall lie on the sofa and get on with my patchwork quilt. What a nice change that will be. I may even get it finished. How lucky I am that I tripped over just today and no other. The ugsome thing was very angry and gnashed his barley sugar teeth. But he soon thought of another idea to make her lose her temper. On Friday, the ugsome thing visited the old woman again. He saw her going to the hen house to collect the eggs. She had three white hens, and they had each laid an egg. As she was walking past the apple tree, he flipped the branch in her face, and she dropped the bowl and broke the eggs. Surely that would make her lose her temper. Well, 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 said the old woman. Now I shall have to have scrambled eggs for dinner, and supper, and scrambled eggs are my favourite food. How lucky I am that the eggs broke just today, and no other. Now the ugsome thing was very angry indeed, and he gnashed his barley sugar teeth, but he soon thought of another idea to make her lose her temper. This idea was a very nasty one, because he was very, very angry indeed. On Saturday, the ugsome thing set the old woman's cottage on fire. Surely that would make her lose her temper. The flames shot up the walls, and soon the thatch roof caught fire. 
Well, 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 said the old woman. That's the last of my old cottage. I was fond of it, but it was falling to pieces, and the roof let in the rain, and there were holes in the floor. When the Uxom thing came along to see if the old woman had lost her temper, he found her busy baking potatoes in the hot ashes and handing them round to the village children. Have a potato, she said to the Uxom thing, holding one out on the point of a stick. It smelled so good that the Uxom thing took it and crammed it into his mouth whole because he was very greedy and some of it went down the wrong way. He choked so hard with rage and hot potato that he burst like a balloon, and there was nothing left but a piece of shriveled, scaly, greenish skin. A little boy threw it on the fire, thinking it was an old rag, and it burned with a spluttering yellow flame. By this time, most of the people in the village were lining up to have a baked potato, and while they waited, they planned how they could help the old woman. I'll build the walls of a new cottage, said one. I'll make the roof, said another. I'll put in the windows, said a third. I'll paper the walls, said a fourth. We'll give her a carpet, sheets, a blanket, a kettle, said the women. By the time all the potatoes were cooked and eaten, her friends had promised the old woman all she needed for a new cottage. The new cottage was not old and tumble down like the first one, but dry and comfortable with a sunny porch. Daisy had a new shed and the dog a new kennel. Only the cat was disappointed as there were no mice for her to chase. There were no holes for the mice to live in. The Visible Wolf by Catherine Store. Polly was walking down the high street one morning when on the opposite side of the road she saw the wolf behaving in a very peculiar manner. Sometimes he put out his tongue at passers-by. Sometimes he did a few dance steps in the gutter. Several times he seemed to be aiming a blow at someone's head. A few people were turning round to stare at him but on the whole, most of them were too polite to appear to take any notice. Polly was not afraid of the wolf when there were plenty of other people about, so she crossed the road and came up to where he was standing, making faces as a baby in a perambulator. Wolf, she said, you're behaving disgracefully. What on earth do you think you're doing? A wolf jumped about four inches in the air as Polly spoke, and even after he had come down to earth again, he couldn't stop shaking. You, you frightened me, he said plaintively, his teeth chattering so that Polly could hear them. I, I didn't expect you to speak to me. How do you know I'm here? Don't be silly, Polly said impatiently. Of course I know you're here. I can see you for one thing. You can see me, the wolf said apparently very much surprised. Of course I can, and from what I can see, you're behaving very badly. I've never seen such an exhibition. But you can't see me, the wolf protested. I certainly can, but I'm invisible. Polly was, in her turn, so much surprised that she couldn't speak for a moment. When she could, she asked, You're what? I'm invisible. You can't see me. No one can. Tell me, Wolf, Polly asked kindly. Do you feel quite well? Have you a headache? The sun has been rather hot this morning. It's not the sun. I'm invisible, I tell you. I don't know how you come to be able to see me, if you really can, 
but I'm invisible to everyone else. How do you know? Polly asked. Well, for one thing, she told me I would be. Who did? The witch I bought the spell from, of course. It was very expensive. But I thought it'd be worthwhile, because now I'm invisible. I can come when you aren't suspecting anything and catch you and eat you without any of this arguing. It's always argue, argue with you, the wolf went on sadly. As soon as I've got it all nice and clear in my head about when I'm going to eat you, you have to start talking and then I get muddled. Somehow you always seem to get me so that I don't know if I'm coming or going, if I'm full or I'm empty. And it always ends the same way, he finished disconsolately. And that's with you going off scot-free and me going off still hungry. So you went to a witch and she made you invisible, Polly prompted him. She can't be much good at her job, she added. She didn't make me invisible there and then. She told me what to do to get invisible. What? Well... I had to go out when the moon was full, that was the day before yesterday, and pick birch bark and mix it with... Here, said the wolf suddenly, I'm not going to tell you this spell for nothing. I had to pay for it, and if you want it, you'll have to pay too. I don't want it, said Polly. Thank you. It obviously isn't any good. Who said so? said the wolf indignantly. I do. It's supposed to make you invisible, isn't it? Well, you're as visible as anything. Anyone can see you. You're as thick and as black and as solid as you ever were. I'm not, cried the wolf. I know I'm not. I've been doing all sorts of things to test it out, and I'm sure I'm invisible. No one has taken any notice of me at all. And they would have if they'd seen me. What have you done? I saw you sticking your tongue out and dancing and making silly faces. But what else have you done? You know how I always walk on my hind legs when I'm with people, so as to look like them, the wolf began. Well, I walked all the way up from the butchers to here on four legs, and no one so much as turned to look at me. There's no reason why they should, Polly said. They probably thought you were... An outsized dog. The wolf snorted angrily, but he went on. I made a horrible face at a baby in a pram, and it didn't take any notice at all. I saw you doing that, Polly agreed. If I'd been the baby, I'd have made some horrible faces back. But babies get so used to people making faces at them, they don't even look any longer. Go on. You see that drinking trough for horses over there? I got into that and had a bath with a piece of soap I happened to have on me. I washed all over, right in front of everyone, and no one blinked an eyelid. They probably agreed that you needed that bath, and in that case they'd be too polite to stare. Is that all you did, Wolf? The wolf looked rather sheepish. It did seem as if I must be invisible by then, he said. And I wanted to do something people couldn't help being surprised by. If they could see it, he stopped. What did you do? Polly asked encouragingly. Of course, I know it's childish, the wolf said. It's not a thing I do in the ordinary way. No. Well, I, I haven't for years... It was just a test, you understand. I expect I will when you tell me what it was. I, I, I wanted to be quite out of the ordinary. I dare say it was almost peculiar, but do let me into the secret. I just ran up and down the street a little. Is that all? Polly asked, disappointed. I believe I said all change once or twice. All change what? And I had a whistle. Occasionally I used it. I see. You ran, you whistled, and you said all change. In, 
In between whiles, I, I may have said chuff. Just chuff? No, I believe I said chuff, chuff. More lifelike, you know. The sound an engine makes when getting up steam. Oh, playing trains, Polly exclaimed. Did you say anything else? There's a peculiar noise the carriages make going over the rails. It sounds more like dippity than anything else. So sometimes you said dippity dee. And then dippity door, dippity dee, dippity door, dippity dee, dippity door. Remarkable imitation, isn't it? Remarkable, agreed Polly. You ran, you all changed, you whistled, you chuffed, you duppity dee, duppity dead. Anything else? I did have a small green flag to wave. Is that all? Somehow or other in the past, I, I seem to have quite a porter's cap, said the wolf carefully. So you wore that? And my sheriff's badge, of course. It all adds to the effect. And where was this remarkable performance, Wolf? asked Polly. Here, said the wolf simply, in the high street. And no one so much as looked at you? Well, of course, there was a certain amount of sound effect, the wolf admitted. And as I was invisible, no doubt some people were surprised to hear the... Uh, impressions of a train without there being anything to see. So some notice was taken. People looked in my direction, yes, but seeing nothing, they were rather at a loss to explain what they heard. Their expressions of amazement were, were quite amusing. Oh, my poor wolf, Polly exclaimed. You have made a fool of yourself. Of course they could see you. They could not interrupted the wolf. I was invisible. Wolf, said Polly seriously, if you are invisible, can anyone see you? Of course not. Not even yourself? Naturally, I couldn't. Wolf, said Polly gently, just look down at the ground where your invisible feet are. The wolf looked down. Someone has left two very dirty paw marks there, he said severely. They are your own paws, Wolf. And those black things above, are they? They are your legs. The wolf stretched out first one paw and then the other and looked at them carefully. He turned round and scrutinised his tail. Then he squinted down and saw the end of his nose. Am I all visible, Polly? He asked in a very small voice. All of you, Wolf. Every single bit of me. Everything, Wolf. Do you mean they all saw me being a train? Did they see me shunting? Did they know it was me saying chuff, chuff? And duppity dee, duppity dare, Wolf? I'll never be able to hold up my head here again, said the wolf miserably, making a public spectacle of myself in the street. I'll never be able to look a baby in the face from now on. It's all your fault, Polly. I'd never have tried to become invisible if I hadn't wanted to get you to eat. Never mind. Visible or invisible, I'll get you yet, and then I shall be revenged. And Polly let him have the last word this time, as she felt rather sorry as he went disconsolately away, for such a very, very visible wolf. Mm -hmm.